Hello. Hello. Welcome to Salem the Podcast. We are your hosts and favorite Salem tour guides. My name is Jeffrey Lilly. And I am Sarah Black. Today, we're going to be talking about the founding of the city of Salem, uh, this nearly 400-year-old New England coastal city. Yeah, one of the oldest in New England, in fact. We're looking at our, like you said, 400th anniversary, getting pretty excited. I know talks are already going on so as like, to like what they're planning. Two years ago, bef- before the pandemic thing, I was at a city meeting where we, we were taught, they had a website, they were talking about stuff. This was before uh, Plymouth, so they hadn't had their 400th. Gloucester hadn't had their, well, mm-hmm. they haven't. Uh, so everyone was like gearing up for yeah. this this big quad quadra. Quadra, Qu- quadricent, quadri- quadricentennial. Quadricent- That's correct, right? Quadricentennial. Quadricentennial. Uh, we were googling this earlier, and and I couldn't. We. <laughs> it, it, we found multiple <laughs> options. All of them sound weird, and we it was like guess that the people in this talk probably had the same I probably had the same problem. conversation what yeah. are we going to call this thing 400th anniversary yeah let's just skip all the weird weird language and just it's, put 400th yeah. it's on not going to be like you know, those uh, uh quarters right the the bicentennial quarters yeah so this is going to be like no quarters no just put 400th yeah no no, no <laughs> bi quadro it's not quad i want to keep saying quadrilateral I keep wanting to say quadriplegic. <laughs> I don't think that's... No, that's not it either. Quad. Like quad, a quad. Yeah. It's four. I think it's just quadricentennial. <clears throat> there we go. So that will be celebrated in 2026. 2026. Which puts us back to 1626. This is when Salem was founded. Mm-hmm. So that is, that's the date, 1626. And uh, we are technically the second established settlement Uh in the New England area. Second only to Plymouth. Yes. But of course, these settlements, they aren't the first. No, they're we are colonized. colonizers. So uh, definitely got to talk about the indigenous was, peoples yeah. that were here before them. Nations of the, of the, the first peoples. Uh, Salem was in an area that was inhabited. It was both called Nomkeg and inhabited by the Nomkeg people. And this is often translated to fishing place or the fishing place. It had all the good fish. They were uh, a nomadic people. Slightly nomadic. Slightly nomadic. Not like Mongols, like ranging Mm -hmm. over the continent, just sort of in the general area, um, likely in Salem and some of the surrounding North Shore areas. Uh, So oftentimes uh, what happens in the narrative is that sort of you you look at the, the documentation from the the colonizers is that it was abandoned or empty and you're like no they were just at their summer home right right <laughs> right they were moving at the yeah, moment yeah and probably likely to return yes so what was found here when uh Roger Conant we'll talk about him again in a little while when he first gets here is what he thought was an abandoned village uh, it was just not currently lived in and fields and these villages were made up of um, I guess the right term is wigwam mm-hmm. right which I think is really cool mm-hmm. so I remember as a much younger human uh, I grew up in Connecticut and we had like a f- whole lesson in one of our years Mm -hmm. about uh the indigenous people and how they lived in the area and how they farmed and we went to a place i I have no idea where it was where we saw these replicas of uh wigwams with the furs outside and like bone tools and uh like how they carved canoes Mm -hmm. and all this stuff and that genuinely stuck with me like I, i have vivid memories of that so when I'm reading about the history of Salem, and I was like, oh, they lived in Wigwam. I was like, I know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's so that, cool. That's pretty cool. We are going to be dedicating an entire episode later on to the indigenous people. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to give you like a brief overview and yeah. the context of the founding. But we'll be revisiting this and hopefully being get the chance to sit down with um, someone in the community. Yeah. Who has ties to those indigenous. Which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Absolutely. So... Let's put Salem in, let's, so this, oftentimes history is assumed to be this list of dates, names, places, people. Which can get a little confusing. Can get very confusing, and unfortunately, the founding, we're going to have to be shooting out a lot of names, dates, places, and people. And bouncing back and forth a little bit, so. Going to try to put the most cohesive narrative together, though. Keep it simple. 
but not throw too much at you and give you and, and hopefully put it into the greater context of the witch trials as well. Yes. So let's jump to Plymouth real quick. Yeah, everyone that, knows Plymouth. Right. You, you know Plymouth, you know Plymouth Rock. Um, if you've seen Plymouth Rock, you probably understand that it is arguably one of the most disappointing monuments <laughs> in the United States. Um, it's You've seen it, right? Yeah, yeah. So I've never seen it. and <laughs> I would say it's it worth was, a trip, but Plymouth itself- Would it, be worth a trip. Is worth a trip. Plymouth Rock is only, you're like, well, I'm here, so I may as well, and I am sorry, city of Plymouth, but I'm sure you all know <laughs> this. It is- It is incredibly underwhelming. Yeah. I was looking at pictures. So I assumed based on the photos that it was just out there and you like walk up to it. But then when you pan out a little bit, you see that it's housed in some type of structure has, you know, railings. So you can't go near it. And it is just this rock Mm -hmm. in a cage surrounded by sand. Like a zoo. Yeah. It looks, it's hilarious. And I, and I asked, I asked Jeff, is that the rock? Like, yeah. is that the rock? And I, I don't know. And I'm sure someone does know. And maybe there is an actual history. And maybe we should go down to Plymouth and find out. But I would, I would wager that it's probably not actually the, the if there was even <laughs> a rock. Oh, and let's not forget, they didn't even land in Plymouth first. <laughs> You're not wrong. Yeah, so we have to backtrack just a wee bit. Just up the Cape. They land in P-Town. So uh, the first land that they spot coming over is uh, Provincetown at the tip of the Cape of Massachusetts. So when you're looking at the state of Massachusetts, you've got that little tail that hangs off to the right. looks like a hook. It's called Cape Cod, Provincetown, or P-Town, right at the tip. So they get there, and they know likely where they are. Um, A lot of this area had been mapped. Mm Mm-hmm. Not explicitly well, but enough for them to know where they were. And they had planned this voyage. It's yeah. not like they just hopped on the boat and said, okay. Let's just see where the... the wind the, takes yeah. us. Um, which the wind didn't take them where they wanted to go, but we'll get to that in, in just a second. But they land in, in P-Town and know that they don't... And if for anyone who's visited the Cape, there's a lot of this sand and you can see the ocean on both sides and it's gorgeous and there's not a lot... It's not a great place... To, to establish a settlement. And if you see um, winter storms, the Cape gets battered uh, pretty heavily. Mm-hmm. So they sail down the coast, uh, make it inland just a little bit, and they're like, okay, this looks like a good place to, to start. Just a reminder, though, they are not where they should be, and they are pressed for time. So they had originally been shooting for New York. Sort of um, the ish. mouth of the Hudson. Yeah, the mouth of the Hudson River. Which I think uh, was actually technically Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia at that point. Uh, but bad storms their, set them back a little bit. Their initial uh, leave date from England, they start the journey. Only the last couple of weeks, there's a leak in their sister ship. They go back to England. They're like two months behind schedule. Mm-hmm. They get here on the 11th of November in 1620. And for any of you who live in New England. say, <laughs> if you know anything about our New England winters. They're going to start getting hit with that. Real hard, real fast. And these folks are not used to winters such as this over in England. They're not, and they're not ready for it. They're not equipped. And it's going to result in a lot of deaths in those first couple of years. About in the first few months, only half the passengers of the Mayflower survive. Mm -hmm. And it's hardship for quite some time. This is frontier territory colonization at its worst. It's not easy. It's, It's a tough life. And... The people who are aboard the Mayflower, the people who settle in Plymouth, are... The Pilgrims. We all know who they are, right? Yeah, you remember doing the little crafts projects right, in little, school? Little, yeah, um, you draw your hand to hand make turkey. it look like a turkey. Yeah. <laughs> or you make the paper um, the paper hats. With the big buckles. Yes, which they didn't really they, have. <laughs> they, there were no big buckles on their shoes and on their hats and, and that sort of stuff. It's a little bit too opulent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the pilgrims leave England. They are separatists. So we should talk. This is where things are going to get slightly complicated. We do have to give you some background on Puritans versus Verse. pilgrims. Mm-hmm. So we just laid out the landing in Plymouth. These first folks coming over, they are technically Puritans. And we'll get to what Puritan means in, in a second. But they are also considered pilgrims. Mm-hmm being that first group that comes over. So think about it this way. 
Pilgrims are Puritans, but not all Puritans are pilgrims. Right. Pilgrims are separatists, as in they wanted to completely separate themselves from the Church of England, whereas Puritans, they... Oh, they could reform it. Yes. Because, you know, Reformation's a thing. Exactly. They wanted to abide more by English tradition. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that, because that's where this narrative starts, is with this Protestant Reformation, 1517. Yeah. Unfortunately, we do have to go quite far back for this one. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of a guy named Martin Luther. Nails that piece of paper to a door, supposedly. 95 theses. And kind of tells the Catholic Church what they can do with themselves. stick it. Yeah. And this is at the time when the printing press was invented. People are more widely reading the Bible. And more access to that knowledge. And I mean, that's what access to books do. Mm -hmm. It it provides access to knowledge and education and uh, critical analysis and literary thinking. And, you know, think what you will, but Martin Luther, the balls on that man. I I know, I (laughs) know. To to, to do that to the Catholic Church, I I think is... One of the most powerful entities at this time, if not the most powerful. He's basically telling God. He'd been taught his whole life, this is it, this is the way, this is... This is God's will. And he gets a book and he says, I, I think you're wrong. So they were looking for more of, how, how should we explain, brief <laughs> I'm not um, sure there's difference. a brief way to, to talk know. about Protestants and, and Catholics. Uh, suffice to say, he breaks with the Catholic Church. Um, and this is Protestantism and Lutherism. And shortly thereafter, in England, sort of following... That example, uh, we got a guy called King Henry the Eighth. Now his his motivations were not nearly as admirable. Uh, he was not looking to reform any religion per se. He Maybe was, his personal life. Yeah, <laughs> more his personal life. Yeah. So King Henry the Eighth, known for his six wives, the first of which was Catherine of Aragon, she wasn't able to pro- provide him with a male heir. I, and so in 1534... I think more accurately, he wasn't able to yes, provide a male yes, heir. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I'm <laughs> appalled at myself for saying that. There's a good chance that it was his syphilis that, she wasn't doing anything that wrong. made him um, impotent. Is that yeah, the right word? Yeah. yeah. So... By 1534, he has met a woman named Anne Boleyn, going to be his second wife in this timeline. But he can't get a divorce. The Catholic Church doesn't allow divorces. He petitions the Pope. He says no. Pope turn, yeah. So the only thing he really thinks he, he can do. He's like, hey, Martin Luther told, he's like, I'm going to do the same thing. So he breaks from the Catholic Church and he forms the Church of England in 1534. So if you think of like, all these religions is like a tree. You've got Catholicism at the I, top. I, I would say the concept of Christianity. Christianity at the top. And then broken into two-ish Yep. with Catholicism and Protestantism. And then from Protestantism, we can go down to Puritans and then well, even further down to pilgrims. Yeah. So, and just as an aside, the more we break down, the more extremist they become. So if you really want to get sort of a, a good idea... The Church of England has broken with the Catholic Church, and then the Puritans are like, well, we still don't think you broke far enough. And then the Pilgrims are like, yeah, you guys, you're you're totally lost. We're getting out of here. Yeah, and these factions get smaller as their ideology becomes more extreme. So the Pilgrims think there's no saving the Church of England. There's no saving uh, that concept. They're done. They're going to rewrite their whole thesis and they can't even be in england to do this they're also getting prosecuted so uh persecuted probably both well yeah i mean i guess yeah (laughs) yeah and uh they hightail the heck out of there and they get here in 1620 but the pilgrims aren't the only ones because the puritans then follow suit so one of those puritans to come over is going to be our first big name that we're dealing with, Roger Conant. If you've visited our city, you may have seen a statue of him out front of the Salem Witch Museum. He's kind of foreboding. <laughs> he's tall, he's got this big hat, this cape, and oftentimes people mistake him for a witch, but he was actually the guy who founded Salem. So he lands in Plymouth at the age of 32. In 1623, 1624, somewhere around there, 
He runs into issues with the pilgrims that are there. There's already some infighting between the separatists and the non-separatists. They don't really see eye to eye on their worshiping practices. These religious issues as well as these rules of government. Right. So remember, pilgrims, they're very anti-English almost. Yeah. They want the to English break from... over. Yeah. And... You know, so there's fight. some there's some issues. So Roger Conant, being a cod fisherman, he leaves with a band of fishermen, travels up the coast, and lands in Cape Ann. So if you look at this map of Massachusetts again, you have this little hook. Uh, on the interior of the hook is uh, Boston. Mm-hmm. And then if you follow up a little bit, it sort of hooks back to the right. Um, and that's Cape Ann, so the Gloucester area today. And he doesn't uh, found Gloucester itself, but Gloucester is credited with being founded in 1623, 1624 when he's there. Things don't really work out too much there. Yeah, um, um, It's a slow start. They're the running into problems. Fishing's fine. It's cold. They don't like the weather. Yeah. Um, Gloucester's not. I mean, <laughs> Salem's it's nice, not. but yeah. it can get real blustery up I'll, there. Yeah. Very cold. Yeah. They don't have quite the protection of nope. the Cape like Salem does. Um, they do get some pretty massive storms up there. And so they're like, yeah, we're good. And they head back, head back south. They head south and they land in Salem, Nom or Keg. which back then was called Nam Keg yeah. at the time. And they will keep that name, yeah. Nam Keg, for a couple of years. So I mentioned this just a little while ago. He finds it, quote unquote, empty, abandoned, these sorts of things. What we know, though, is twofold. The Nam Keg people, as we said, uh, weren't living there at the time. They were mm-hmm. at their other homes. In addition, though, and we didn't bring this up, is that probably about 1616, so maybe just about 10 years prior, a massive amounts of plague and disease uh, spurred by the colonization uh, from farther south on the continent had wiped out probably close to 80% of the indigenous population. And that is both horrible and tragic. But one of the results is that it leaves a lot of untended fields, empty buildings, Mm -hmm. uh, these sorts of things. So when the colonizers, whole villages, gone. So when you come here and you're like, oh, yeah, here's somewhere for us to stay. These buildings have long since been abandoned due to death and disease. But finding an uh, uh, empty place to live was not entirely uncommon. So they set up shop here. And the Namkeg people uh, come back. And they're like, oh, cool. Hi, friends. They're not, you know, angry, combative. Uh, They fish with them. They sort of live around them, uh, sort of shared the land for a little while. It won't last forever, of course. Yeah. And then... And do think for a moment, put your your head in the mindset of these Puritans. These folks were coming over here for religious freedom to be able to pursue a life they saw would be better than what they were dealing with over in England. When they show up at this abandoned village, of course, you're going to think, well, God put this here. This is a gift from God. There's a clearing. There's, there's places to plant. I mean, it's food, anything that they could want. Yeah. It it must've genuinely other than the harsh winters. uh, I mean, New England's gorgeous in the spring and summer. Mm -hmm. And I, I can, I see the appeal and I can, I can totally, not understand because obviously that's the wrong word. Appreciate. Mm, that's probably also the wrong word. I, I see what they saw. Yeah. They were wrong in viewing it that way. Right. But they get here and they look, this must have looked wonderful and appealing. Yep. And with their extremist beliefs, their they belief, thought it was their divine right. Yeah. God had sent them here. This was their land. And their new Jerusalem. Yes. The. <clears throat> the city of Salem is is named after Jerusalem. Salem, by the way, means peace after the city of peace. And uh, there is some discussion about the origin of that. Jeffrey is incredibly skeptical, <laughs> but it's pretty widely known so, or so, so, believed, so, so hold theorized. On, hold, on, hold on, let's let's introduce the other player yes. to, to this narrative. Okay, uh, before we have that argument. So Roger Conant lands in 1626. Yep, it is then known as Namkeg. Yep, but then in 1629, 
another guy. Oh, and we should also mention he was voted in as quote unquote governor yeah, so, by his comrades. So there's a small group commonly called the Dorchester Company, mm-hmm. uh, probably no more than 20 people. Uh, and they are like, hey, Conant, you're our guy. You're in charge. Uh, just because they need someone of a, a leader. Right. And he's like, okay, I'll do that. And then in England, at the same time, there's other efforts by the New England Company to establish uh, more firm control over the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And with the Dorchester Company failing, yep. they needed to send over a different charter, so they an get, actual charter. They get an actual charter from the king, uh, granting them these powers, these land rights, uh, shipping, industry, all these things. And this goes on a ship, a uh, couple of ships, a couple of people, and John Endicott. Is one of those. Yes. And we should also note that with this is also the birth of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So the official, obviously the, the pilgrims get here, Gloucester's founded, Salem's founded. We have these founded. little settlements. Yeah. But the actual, this is it. The official colony begins right then. And Endicott is appointed the first governor. Yep. So he gets to Nomkeg, uh, meets with Conant, and... There uh, is a peaceful transition of power. And I call shenanigans. I I, under- I tried to come up with a joke in <laughs> reference to like <laughs> the most recent election. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there is a, and it, it's in a lot of history books that like there is this myth of Salem. Yeah, like it, it's, it's a it's a local local lore, legend, local yeah. lore legend myth, which is a little bit why I call shenanigans because I just I think it is one of the most whitewashed. <laughs> concepts i've ever read Mm -hmm. like i can i just have this image of these two guys being like hey we're friends and we get along let's name this land peace like you see it in like some kids cartoon um and uh obviously there's a lot of people who will probably dispute that with me (laughs) so apologies to all of you i i think the idea that uh according to their religious beliefs and their religious ideology this land is uh a, a divine right from God and this is their chosen city and Jerusalem is the chosen city, the city of peace. So they name this new land, this new city after that city. And I don't think it had anything Anything to do do with the transition of power. Well, it's a rosy story. Nonetheless, it is is a rosy story. Um, And I think also it's an interesting story uh, that fits well into, into some of our, more violent concepts of history uh, when Salem is the seat of the trials and those sorts of things you can look back and, but well, originally we were, we were a city of peace Mm -hmm. and, and these sorts of things. Um, I always find it kind of ironic. Yeah. I actually crack a joke on my tour about it. But then it also then reties in the narrative, like Anton said, as is this symbol and metaphor for change. Nice plug. Thank you. <laughs> very nice. That so, was very nice. So I understand the myth and the lore, and and I think that's what we should take it as. I like that. I can yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. So Salem. Endicott, yeah. Endicott shows up, 1629, with the new charter, now establishing the Massachusetts Bay Colony as an official entity, and then he leaves. Yeah. Um, well... He's here for, so his... No, he stays up here for a bit, right? Well, yeah, but but he, so his job or his his role is to establish and prep Salem for more Puritans. Um, and whatever that entailed, maybe building buildings and establishing roadways and docks. Infrastructure. And, and infrastructure yeah. uh, for the oncoming storm that was to be uh, the Winthrop fleet. And with them, the Great Migration. Yeah. So brings us to another individual. 1630, so just a year later. John Winthrop of the Winthrop Fleet leads a group of folks, Puritans, yep. over here, and they land in Salem. In Salem. So this is probably uh, about 17, 18 ships. Uh, 11 or so were the Winthrop Fleet. It's probably only from about 700 to 1,000 people uh, sailing over and coming to start a new life in Salem. Uh, they likely land on the opposite or the, the, the North River side 
of what is now Bridge Street. So if you're looking down at a map of Salem, uh, you have our harbor, you have the Salem Willows. If you follow those around to your left, um, you're going to be across from Beverly, and they likely came right up through that area and docked on that side of the river, keep themselves away from the harbor, away from the ocean, where they could keep all those ships safe. And while you're at it, check out an old map of Salem, like one of the oldest you can find, because the land will look a lot different. Mm -hmm. Uh, That river will be... Uh, like substantially larger yeah. than you see it is today. So. We've landfilled in a, yep. a lot. So the Winthrop fleet gets here. And one thing I also sort of want to mention here is also what's going on in England. Because while they might be separated by an ocean, these two entities are driven by each other's actions. So by 1629, King Charles had dissolved Parliament. He'd done it like one or two times. His dad had done it several times, uh, but he was like, no, we're done. He puts his foot down. He is now ruling solely and alone. As the absolute ruler. As the absolute ruler. Um, So remember, the Puritans believe they can help reform. But now, with no representation, no Parliament, no one to go and speak on their behalf, or even them speaking on their behalf, because they had elected members of Parliament... They're like, <laughs> screw this guy. Mm-hmm. We're done. Great migration. Probably next 10 years. Thousands. Uh, close to, to 20,000 Puritans have established themselves in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. We should also mention by 1630, we have Boston. Yes. So Winthrop yeah, doesn't, doesn't really like Salem. like Salem that much. Yeah. And he ends up going a little bit further south and... Boston is founded in 1630. To a location at the mouth of the Charles River. So it's kind of cool to like think about Salem being older than Boston. I feel like most people assume right. that Boston. Boston is like one of the OG, which they are. Yeah. But, but there not, were a couple yeah. that preceded uh, it. And it's weird that it, I think it's because our narrative doesn't fully come into play for another 50 years or so. Yeah. Right? We're known for the witch trials. Yeah. So They're known Plymouth for, is known for... The landing, of course. Boston is known as the capital, and then Salem, War of Independence, a, an equally famous city. But no, 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 no. We we were here first, guys. Sorry. You. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Winthrop goes down, founds Boston. Now that's just about it. When when it comes to Salem, when it comes to the founding, we are we center around this, you know, sixteen twenty six, sixteen thirty sort of sort of area. Um, I think one more little uh, interesting fact that, that I like to, to think about is on the Winthrop fleet, right, in 1630, is a guy called uh, Simon Bradstreet. And who was he? He was the governor, sort of, kind of, quote unquote, governor, acting, sitting governor, acting, I'd, yeah. acting governor in 1692. When those trials, so well, when, when the activity, when the, the young girls, girls first start suffering these afflictions, when the accusations first start flying, when the first arrests are made, he's, he's at in the charge. Top. He's, he's at the top. And this guy had come over on the Winthrop fleet. I think he was 26 years old at that point in his life. And uh, I just think it's fascinating. It, obviously, we can't see everything through his eyes. Right. But if if we could have, you know, he he would have seen liked, everything. Seen, His perspective up yeah. until that point. He was alive when King James was alive. He was a young man in England. Uh, had seen the uh, uh, tearing of, of the religious organizations. Had known that the Mayflower had left, and a few years later, opts to to, to join the Winthrop fleet to to find this new land in Salem, and in the end becomes the governor. He doesn't die till 1697. I think he was 93 years old. And that's that's a chunk of history yeah. to, 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 to really get a hold of. I, I think that's fascinating. Now, we mentioned he was interim governor. He was kind of just filling in for the moment yeah. because S- Salem and Massachusetts Bay Colony, more correctly, doesn't have a charter at the moment. So they had been going through the English Civil War across the pond, mm-hmm. The charter is revoked in 1684, yep. and but by 1692, we are reissued. Yes. And with that new charter, 
we also get a new governor. Yes. And this guy, who you're going to hear his name <laughs> time and time again, you, and we will be, and you've heard it before, and you'll hear it again, we'll be dedicating a whole episode to him. This guy is William Phipps. Sir William Phipps? Yes. Yes, he is a sir. Which we'll also get into that, sir. I'm putting big air quotes, <laughs> big air quotes. Around, the, around the sir. So he is making his way over to Boston, and oops, there's some people there's witches in jail <laughs> we talked about that in the uh origin the, the the history of the trials and episode. it catches us up to 1692 yeah another interesting thing about this phipps bradstreet is what had been happening just a little bit so we're like what uh not quite 10 years without charter mm-hmm. right what happens in the middle the Dominion of New England. Which I love. That yeah, have name, you ever heard of that before? Right? And any of you sitting out there know that we were once the Dominion of New England? I feel like you, when you learn about colonial history, especially in the early Americas, they make you learn all the names of the colonies, but yeah. they totally skip Ignore over the, this the Dominion. thing. It, it was short-lived. It went from like uh, Delaware, so sort of New Jersey, all of New Jersey, parts of New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, parts of Maine huge swath of land. Governor Andrews was in charge. This was after our charter is revoked. They they bring him in, and then he kind of sucks. Uh, they the, remove him, there's this and then revolution. they replace him with Bradstreet, yeah. who had been the governor before the Dominion yes. was established. So they were like, he was already in charge. Let's, let's give him back, and he knows what he's doing, and everyone's kind of agreeing to do the right thing. But it's also this um, lack of official charter. Right. That leads to some of the effects of the trials. So everything that's happened from, I don't know, I'd say 1620, but maybe from yeah, King you Henry can, I VIII, was going to say, you can go even further yeah, back. Up and have added to the Salem Witchcraft Trials, which you is why- You have to remember history doesn't exist in a bubble. Yeah. We even even the context. naming of Salem mm-hmm. is important to the narrative of the trials. It all, it all ties in. It's all pieces to one big puzzle. So that's going to bring us to our close on the founding of Salem. Hope you enjoyed the episode today. Our next episode is going to be on shipping. Salem's rich, diverse maritime shipping history. We'll talk all that and pepper. Pepper. One of my favorite spices, actually. Be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and tell a few friends. And make sure to follow us on all the social medias. That is at Salem Podcast, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. And any questions, feel free to email us, hello, at SalemThePodcast.com. And when you come visit Salem, make sure to book a tour with either Sarah or myself. Links to both those companies are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. See you later.